project. Um, and uh, essentially its main purpose is to support the uh, involvement of European experts in international ICT standardization. Um, you, you can see the link to the website there where you, you can get more information. Uh, so Stand ICT, uh, as part of its project, it set up a, an observatory, which we're calling EOS. Um, and it is basically the vehicle through which the project um, monitors what's going on globally in ICT standardization. Um, and, and you can see in a minute uh, how it does that and the types of um, output and products that EOS is going to produce. Um, so when you look at uh, EOS, the, the, the way it's structured is um, it's setting up a what they call TWGs or uh, technical working groups on particular topics. Um, the topics are chosen uh, effectively as they are the ones most relevant to uh, European Commission policy objectives. Um, and they're the ones that you'll also see uh, being uh, highlighted and, and being a priority in, for example, the uh, ICT rolling plan for ICT standardization. So currently, um, there are six technical working groups. Um, you can see the topics there, AI, blockchain, cyber, smart cities, trusted info, and, and data spaces. So effectively, this the, the TWGs are a collection of experts uh, who, who meet in, in, over a short period of time, usually six to eight weeks, and they really do some um, uh, involved work to come up with a landscape uh, analysis as a what's happening globally on that topic in standardization. And I'll cover um, a slide in a second showing uh, the type of document that they will then produce. Um, but uh, effectively, the goal is to do a detailed landscape analysis and then ultimately uh, drive some gap analysis uh, in, in the important areas. Uh, but in, in the context of today's discussion, um, it's the seventh uh, TWG that we're talking about, it's, it's TWG Academy or the Standards Academy. Um, and uh, our purpose um, is to effectively, uh, it, it, unlike the other working groups, this is a, a the, the TWG Academy is going to um, stay active for the full duration of the Stand ICT project. Uh, so it's a three, three and a half year uh, effort. So it's it's um, it's you know much slower than the other ones, but effectively, what we're um, talking about is is the the why and the how of uh, standardization, and I'll cover that uh, in more detail uh, in a second. Um, so here, just recently, actually, the first um, output from one of the TWGs was published, and the link is there. So it, it was the Artificial Intelligence Group. Um, it was it was led by Lindsay Frost. Uh, um, from NEC, uh, and effectively, it's a very well put together um, analysis of everything that's happening standardization-wise uh, in artificial intelligence. Um, and, and as I just indicated, the next step then would be to um, hopefully foster um, discussion between SDOs, policymakers, uh, industry, societal stakeholders to. Um, come up with a, with a gap analysis uh, so that um, the, the most important standards will, um, will be developed and, and, and as importantly that the amount of overlap will be reduced between um, SDOs and consortia. Um, so uh, just in one or two slides on uh, just a little more detail on what the TWG Academy is about. So as I said our scope is uh, education on the why and the how uh, of standards and standardization. So if you are a um, somebody new to industry, if you are a student, if you uh, are, sorry, an academic working in an in a, um, institution or a policymaker, uh, it doesn't matter what, what type of stakeholder you are. We, we believe that there are aspects of standardization that you should be aware of um, to help you with what you're trying to do. So, you know, so we're really trying to put together everything about the standardization system, how it works, how you engage, how you can advance and improve your knowledge. Um, the terms of reference for the group, 
uh, I, I mentioned already, we're, we're going to be, it's an expert group um, and it's sort of for the three years of the project. Uh, so we want to uh, really study what's out there already. Uh, we're not, the intention is not to create new material, but to curate what's already there and make it available. Um, we really want to try and engage every type of stakeholder. Uh, and, you know, we're not uh, only focusing on, you know, let's say formal SDOs, but, but any standard setting organization, industry consortia, et cetera, uh, we, we want input, uh, or we, we want to cover the, the whole landscape. Um, and all, all, in, all stakeholder types, of course, um, need to be involved as well. So, you know, if you're um, uh, a societal organization, you might have a different view on why you need standards, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, we, we are still defining the types of uh, deliverables and output that the group will produce. Uh, it's, it's under, under discussion. Uh, but we, we, from a governance perspective, we report back into the Stand ICT uh, advisory group, the EAG, on a regular basis. Um, and we'll be presenting our, our work products as we go along at Stand ICT workshops and, and events like this today. Um, so currently, what we're planning, the, the, the two main things we're working on initially is, is trying to catalog um, and put together a repository of all the material that's out there in, in various shapes, forms. It doesn't matter. Anything that's standards, education related, um, we're, we're, we're pulling together and we're creating a database um, and we'll make this available. Uh, so there's some, there are some fantastic um, um, items there already that we can use straight away. Um, so that's in parallel then, and this is kind of, I guess, one of the key um, deliverables is going to be what we're calling a, a competency matrix, uh, where depending on the type of stakeholder you are uh, and your level, your current level of expertise, we will be defining pathways uh, through the uh, material that's there. So if you're a beginner, you know, you can take course one, two, seven, and 10. And, and if you're more advanced, then obviously there's a different pathway that you might want to go through. Um, um, pathway, as I just mentioned. Um, we, we haven't decided or even discussed this yet in much detail, but potentially, you know, some sort of a certification scheme. Um, you know, that's, I, you know, that's something that I, I guess we probably won't be deciding for another few months at least. So obviously we'd love to hear any feedback um, you have here today or, or afterwards on, on, on this, uh, on the current plan deliverables or what you think would be um, worthwhile doing in addition uh, to these. Um, in terms of the membership, uh, to the left of the dotted line there, you can see the, the um, most of the existing members. Um, and to the right, uh, we have a few that, that haven't signed up yet um, and we're, we're talking to. Um, obviously, it's important that we get all the societal stakeholders in. So, so uh, eTook and, and, and ECOS uh, um, are important there. Etsy, of course, and Etsy have published already some great material. Um, so, you know, I'm sure uh, once we get the right, talk to the right people there that, you know, they will become more active. Uh, and on the left, you can see a collection of, uh, of the different stakeholder types that we have uh, at the moment. There's, I think there's about, there's four, 12, 12 of us in the group and there's, you know, seven, eight or nine uh, attending most calls. So it's, it's uh, relatively uh, active. Um, so moving on to uh, today's speakers, um, very shortly, uh, Thomas Arraid from uh, European Commission DG Connect will, will uh, cover um, essentially, you know, why the, why the European Commission is interested in education about standardization. And, and I think Thomas will, will be saying a few words um, in particular about the upcoming uh, European standardization strategy. Uh, Thomas is a senior expert uh, in DG Connect uh, and in fact is the uh, project officer for the, the Stand ICT uh, project. Um, after uh, Thomas, we have Dr. Martin Chapman. Um, Martin, as you can see, works with uh, Oracle for his, his day job, M many years in, in uh, standardization, both in formal SDOs and many consortia. Um, I think vice chair, correct, of the, the board at uh, Oasis Open also, or at least was. Um, 
Uh, and Martin's going to talk about the um, industry view, I guess, on, on education about standardization. Uh, and Martin is also a member of the Stand ICT um, advisory group. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Professor Ivana Mijatovic, uh, who is um, from the University of Belgrade. Uh, as you can see there, a uh, full professor in, in the Faculty of Organizational Sciences, but also very active in URAS, the um, organization uh, about research in, in, in standardization. Um, and uh, uh, obviously, Ivana will talk about the, the view from the uh, uh, educators or the academic perspective. Um, so uh, with that, I'm not sure, um, Francesco, was there any uh, questions that are urgent to take now, or uh, can we defer to the end? Uh, uh, <clears throat> maybe we, we just have a uh, Reynard Weisinger that uh, he's asking if the publication relevant in the field of standards education is mostly not limited to ICT. Does the collection of materials exceed ICT? Maybe you can uh, shed some lights on this. Um, the, feed, the, well, the, the primary focus of this group is on ICT standardization, but the, um, you know, when, when we're putting together, for example, a competency, competency matrix on standardization, um, it's going to be generic, a lot of it is going to be generic. So whether it's ICT or engineering or, you know, materials or food, you still, the, the process of how, it, how standardization works, how it, how it links with policy and regulation, that's all common really, no matter what the domain is. So um, I think uh, uh, it, it, it will be, even though the focus is ICT, it will be useful on a much wider basis. Okay, yeah, just so, to follow up on what, what, uh, what Brian was saying. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole focus of the standard ICT uh, project is, is in the ICT domain. And the European Observatory is for ICT standards, um, but there is a lot of, of um, uh, say, uh, cross-cutting areas uh, around education, which will be common to both. Thank you. Thanks. And I see um, Reinhardt has a second question about the uh, will the reports. Oh, yes, you've answered it. Yes, the reports will be available um, publicly. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, with that, then we, we'll uh, move on to um, our first speaker. Uh, today and uh, Thomas, I'll, I'll hand over to you. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brian, and uh, good morning to everybody to this uh, nice uh, webinar. It's a webinar basically for you. I will try to share my screen uh, with the uh, with the presentation. I hope you can see it now. Yes. Yes. So uh, to, to make you a little bit um, uh, uh, the, the frame of this work. So my main message to you is basically that uh, education and training, it's a key element for standardization. And uh, we from the European Commission, we are trying to uh, support it as much as possible from that side. So here at this moment, we are just at the beginning of a journey uh, into education and training. We, we have to remind that uh, standardization overall is voluntary and it's a bottom-up pro, uh, process. So basically from industry, but also from societal stakeholders and governments can contribute to standardizations in that uh, part. What we have seen here now with the emergence of uh, China, there is now a huge effort of other areas uh, or other regions driving in the standardization systems. So I think from our side, we have to work a little bit on our um, basis in standardizations. And here, uh, the European Commission, uh, beginning of this year, has already published uh, a strategy, uh, the industrial strategy uh, on standardization. And within the strategy, um, uh, there was uh, announced that this year a standardization strategy will come out. So today you have uh, 
standardization it's basically governed by uh, internationally especially in by wto principles but before uh, it was governed by the code of good practices all that needs to be kept in mind for the different people uh, how we work on standardization what is uh, the main purpose of of that work and uh, here from the commission we will now uh, go forward uh, with uh, um, EU um, standardization strategy, which will be published in the uh, third quarter or maybe fourth quarter of this year. We just published on the 29th of June a uh, roadmap how we will uh, work from that. This uh, roadmap uh, uh, outlines that from the strategy, the goal is to consolidate and improve the, the EU standardization system so that it continues to support well functioning of the single market and the competitiveness of the EU industry and protects EU citizens and the environments. So overall, the strategy addresses uh, four pillars. One of them is here to modernize uh, the uh, and consolidate the European standardization systems to ensure that it's better uh, oriented towards meeting EU's main interests on policy priorities. Uh, for ICT, we have uh, right, uh, or put them down in the rolling plan for ICT standardization. Uh, covers our core principles, values, and notable our new um, uh, policy dimensions like the green digital industrial tr uh, transition in a timely manner. The second part is basically about a more strategic and coordinated approach on the global level, like I mentioned. So we, we're looking into how we're addressing uh, the geopolitical challenges and there we're discussing with the expert group, multi-stakeholder platform for ICT standardizations, how we can address this in a certain way. And uh, third one is uh, bridging uh, the uh, research uh, to uh, standardizations, how we effectively uh, can gather for, from the research to the standardization and what are the best practices and how we can uh, profit more from, from the innovation program. And the fourth, and this is exactly what uh, here we would like to say here within this uh, webinar, is how we are addressing uh, the uh, standards related education skills and ex expertise. And this is basically in both uh, public and uh, private environment. This is not uh, the beginning. We had already uh, done uh, certain training and indications in the joint initiative for standardizations. What we had uh, was this GIS Action 3, where already a lot of work has been uh, put together. But now here, I'm really happy with this uh, Stand ICT project, that again, a new momentum is coming together, where uh, like, um, uh, Brian already said, here uh, uh, material will be put together in order to uh, to help the people to find their way. This is, uh, as said already, it's, it's education is training as one part, but on the other side, it's also difficult for the people to find uh, their way in the jungle of standardizations, because there's more than hundreds of foreigners on consortia and uh, with different rules, with different uh, uh, principles, and uh, all that needs to be a certain way addressed. So this gives you a little bit our perspective. We will come up uh, in uh, Q3 2021 with more uh, details on why, how we will implement the strategy uh, related to education, training, and skills. And um, and I wish you a good um, a webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, so uh, I think we, um, we're now going to take the second topic um, from Ivana on the uh, education and standardization from an academic point of view. Um, 
Ivan, are you, are you ready to present? Yes, I'm ready. Um, I guess what while you're doing that, Justin, we there was a few questions in in the chat that were answered during the Q and A. Is was it? Were there any other questions anybody wanted to urgently ask now, or we can take them at the end also? Okay, seems like not. So, uh, Ivana, sorry, over to you then. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and. Uh, uh, thank you for invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, my task today is uh, to talk about uh, academic point of view uh, related to education in uh, standardization. So basically, this group, there is no need to talk how standards and standardization is important. But on the other side, universities are often seems uh, as uh, main spaces, let's say, like that, uh, for developing necessary competences related to standardization for the future decision makers. However, there are a lot of problems uh, in that. Uh, standardization is neither a science nor generally accepted uh, academic discipline. Uh, so uh, the Academics perspective, or uh, mainly uh, uh, university teachers, struggle uh, to get some new content uh, in their overcrowded curricula. Uh, furthermore, there are still uh, very uh, active myths on uh, standardization. One of them is that once standardization is recognized in higher education curricula, a general awareness and appreciation of standards and standardization uh, will be automatic results. So key question is will be. On the other side, there is a claim that we do not need masters in standardization, uh, but we need a larger or a need to enlarge the groups of people who are aware of usefulness of standards. So basically the main tasks of uh, universities and university teachers is to uh, bring or to raise awareness related to standardization. However, uh, we just uh, see that uh, there are a lot of initiatives uh, related to standardization and uh, in past 20 years, there were many initiatives related to education about standardization. Uh, I was analyzing 72 by now, and uh, the main, uh, main issue in all these initiatives uh, is related that a lot of them uh, were developed in isolation from each other. So there are a lot of valuable inputs, but still a lot of works on developing curricula in reality. Uh, so basically, uh, in uh, all uh, initiatives I, uh, I analyzed are related uh, to basically three, uh, three areas, uh, teaching content, teaching and training methods, and networking. So basically all of them are very valuable inputs for academic, for, from academic point of view. But on the other side, uh, it can be seen uh, that most of the uh, initiatives or activities uh, who are planned to help, uh, uh, mod help uh, university teachers had basically two main problems. Uh, they are content-centered and teacher-centered. So what's that mean? They are not uh, accustomed to be uh, used in teaching new generation Z. Now at university levels, we have generation Z with very specific needs. And especially in time of pandemia with remote teaching and learning, the after pandemia, it was, uh, uh, it will be issue, a great issue, how to teach new generation after uh, we get a lot of remote and a lot of e-education uh, provided. Uh, 
but the main uh, the main reason why I decided to talk uh, about uh, many uh, initiatives or activities which were provided to help education uh, and academia is something that I would call deep misunderstanding among the uh, sides or actors who were involved in these initiatives. So basically, uh, if it is the main task is to build awareness in higher education, I have to say that it is uh, very difficult and time consuming uh, in the meaning that uh, what we can do at university level, at a bachelor level or, or master level uh, is to develop competence. So we need a lot of effort to develop competence as proven ability to use knowledge and skills related to standardization in their, in their work and uh, further study situation. However, the practice need expertise. Of course, that one of the main expertise uh, component of expertise is knowledge, but expertise needs uh, experience and problem solving. So key problem now for developing successful uh, standardization courses is related how to bring practice to Generation Z in higher education. Basically, on this very simple and clear presentation like uh, all academics presentation are, I tried to just uh, point it what we need uh, to do. So if we, if uh, the problem or if the task is uh, uh, building awareness and learning outcome should be that person or uh, uh, student uh, should have uh, competences in standardization, uh, that are the two basically things. First level uh, is level of understanding based on factual knowledge. That is basic level, and that is starting point for the competence, but not competences yet. On the other side, level of applying and understanding is needed to be achieved at the classes or at the learning process in higher education, in bachelor, even or master studies to provide a competence. But still, there is no expertise. How can we gain expertise? Uh, but trying to understand or trying to come from uh, general to specific, learning about standards should be after learning about standardization. So specific context, specific domain, either uh, information security of data mining should be, uh, should be placed after the some sort of general knowledge. However, still there is no expertise. So basically, the main point uh, of my presentation is to uh, university professor, university staff can uh, work on competences, but for development of expertise, we need larger communities. So if you, you can see on uh, my very simple presentation, uh, how, but it is not easy task and uh, a lot of things was done in the last uh, activities and there is some sort of experiences in that but we need a lot of collaboration among practice standardization practice and all of the uh, people or organization and uh, knowledge which was gained in uh, professional areas to bring and to uh, to uh, level up for the for the classes or for the formal education. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Ivana, um, for that interesting uh, insight. Um, and, you know, I think uh, some of the work you've outlined there is obviously going to be central to the um, competency matrix that we're, we're working on. Um, so look forward to continuing that discussion. Uh, does anybody else have, have uh, questions on Ivana's presentation? Uh, 
I think Brian, we have a question from Hans Gar. It's in it's in the chat. It's quite elaborated, so maybe you can take a look or take it for for the final Q and A session. Um, okay, I'll take a look here now. Um, are we preparing briefing materials aimed at government? Uh, I've been getting that. Uh, so um, I guess yeah, I would say we're not preparing briefing materials. As, as at least as I think you understand the term briefing materials, that that's not the main focus, but we are certainly um, very keen to, uh, in everything we do in terms of the, the competency matrix um, or any training materials that we're gathering, uh, one of the consumers um, is going to be government, is going to be public administrations, is going to be policymakers. So we are, uh, that, and that's why we, we are trying to engage them in the working group so that we uh, we ensure that that is considered. Um, yeah, maybe I can answer also a little bit, Brian. Mm -hmm. I think the dimension from the government, it's quite wide. Uh, this goes from public procurement and public procurement has a direct impact to standards, especially what we promoted here from the European Commission in the past is to use standards and uh, uh, to avoid uh, vendor lock-ins and uh, to increase competitions in public procurements. So public procurements for sure is one part of uh, importance for the governments. But there are other parts uh, like, uh, for example, briefings like you mentioned uh, in different areas of the world, how standardization can uh, transpose our policies and our regulations, but also technical barriers to trade. All that is uh, are different dimensions, I would say, on standardizations. And uh, this will be captured in other uh, um, parts. For example, there is some um, ongoing activities, as you probably have heard about from the G7, uh, where a toolkit is established, uh, where like-minded countries will talk between themselves uh, to see how to get organized to present here uh, the uh, or defend our values in the international standardization schemes. But this is a little bit outside here of this education and training. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Um, actually, ju just. One comment for me, I guess, on Ivan, on your presentation and, and the, the Generation Z uh, concept and, and approaching things differently. Um, a couple of years ago, at a standard, an ISO IEC standards meeting, um, I met my first Google uh, employee that was uh, uh, in my 25 years of, of uh, attending standards meetings. Uh, it's the first time I've seen Google engaged. But, uh, when talking to her, um, it was interesting to hear the only way that they were able to generate um, enthusiasm amongst our staff to get involved in standardization was to create a badge system. So on their internal employee you know, profiles, um, whatever they were using, um, if you dedicated you know, five hours a month to uh, something to do with standards, you got a, you got a bronze badge and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as they started to introduce that, the level of engagement shot up because they all wanted to share on their social networks that they had these, you know, extra badges. So um, that concept of of how you engage for different stakeholders is is, is well made. Yeah, definitely. Do you want me to uh, comment your comment or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, everyone wants the result. So young people, they. Uh, for uh, I'm teaching at business school, business and informatics. And uh, it is very important to understand that, uh, of course, they want to fill their CV. Badges, uh, badges are valued uh, um, as much as they are known. So if you are working in Google, Google management recognize it. But uh, in uh, many countries, in many uh, universities, uh, it's a questionable, is, it, is that badge recognized? So uh, if... Uh, I think the important result of this uh, project should be uh, some educational concept related to badges. And uh, informal education is stronger than ever. 
and Generation Z has no four or three years to finish bachelor studies. It's too long per period for Generation Z. Yes. And, yeah. and it also builds on the networking pillar that you mentioned in your slides as well. So that's that's how the badge system sort of um, infiltrates. Yes. So, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, well, listen, in the interest of time, I think where we should move on, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A we'll get to in a minute. But um, Martin, if you're ready to um, present, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, can you see my slides and everything? Yes, yes. Martin. <laughs> good. So, yeah, so uh, as Brian said, so my name is Martin Chapman. I'm Senior Director of Standards and Compliance Policy with Oracle. I've been with Oracle for 19 years now, 19 and a bit, so it's quite a long time. And I started off as a you know, standards practitioner, uh, moved up the ranks to sort of chairing committees and being on boards, and now I'm doing sort of standards policy work um, with Thomas as one of my main customers there. So. Hi, Thomas. Um, and so, so I just want to give us an, uh, just an overview. Um, I have to uh, hold on. Oh, I have to give the uh, the official uh, public relations uh, uh, disclaimer. This is a part of the statement. I'm not making any uh, promises or or uh, uh, a product direction. Um, uh, so this is just the safe harbor statement. You can read at your leisure. Um, so it, it, my job is, I, I describe my job as the uh, sort of standards compliance policy, sort of the intersection of um, um, regulations, standards, and sort of Oracle products and services. So where there's that intersection, it's sort of the, although I come from the standards angle, it's that intersection that's interesting. I mean, Oracle started off uh, in sort of 1997 with three guys, uh, one of them, Larry, you might, you might know Larry, um, very... Uh, colorful character and they they built a database product um, based, based on this relation uh, relationship model and they wanted effectively to build uh, something that was compatible with IBM system R database at the time uh, but they couldn't uh, replicate it fully because uh, IBM hid all the error codes so it wasn't accessible so in other words um, it, there, there was no sort of standards around so even though they sort of tried to compete in the market, um, you know, with uh, at the time a pretty dominant player, IBM was very dominant in the uh, in the seventies and eighties or sixties, seventies, eighties. But eventually, uh, you know, they uh, Oracle persisted, uh, and sort of the, the work um, went to ANSI, and then it uh, so the work on the SQL standard went to ANSI, and then eventually became an international standard. And you know, Oracle flourished, and the database market flourished because of because of standards. Um, and that's really the, the DNA of Oracle. It did start off as a standards-based organization. Um, their early decision to use C as well, which was available on multiple platforms, um, also helped with the sort of portability aspects of, of the database as well. So the, the reason Oracle is still committed to standards is because we believe that they're good for business. Right? They, I'm just going to, sorry, I just need to, yeah, that's fine. Um, they open up markets. Um, they create competition, as we just said, that, that um, example with, with IBM it creates competition and it does stop dominant players um, from uh, with proprietary solutions, um, ultimately, because the, the more that companies are standards based, the more companies that um, adopt standards, the more choice there is for consumers. So customers um, then have choice, but they also help, it helps them to understand uh, the product offerings, if they're standards based. No, it's um, not. There's a figure. <laughs> right, somebody's going mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, um, so, st standards, uh, customers can actually understand better product offerings because if they're standards based, they can start uh, standards based procurement. And this is what we see with um, public, uh, public sector and, and government based procurement. Uh, and it also helps them to integrate with their own uh, systems. And it also helps them to employ. Uh, people with the similar skills. So standards also help on that skill-based um, <clears throat> uh, skill skill based uh, portability. Um, for us, standards have sped, or well, they speed up acquisitions and internal product integration. When we, um, when, uh, Oracle has <laughs> been on a very aggressive uh, acquisition spree. When I started uh, you know, 19 years ago, we had 40,000 employees. Now we're at 135,000. And that is predominantly through acquisitions. Um, we, you know, there's, there's a number of uh, 
you know, famous names that, that have been acquired, including BEA, Sun, and uh, Micros, which is a hospitality uh, retail uh, vendor from, from Germany. Um, and they're very big in the sort of the hotel uh, restaurant uh, business. And these acquisitions were all fueled because they were predominantly Java based, um, Java being a standard that was obviously developed by Sun and is now owned by Oracle. And, it, and being standards based, not, not obviously not just the language, but other uh, standards based um, the standards being implemented, helps you to integrate, uh, helped us to integrate our products as well. So it's not only just good for markets and customers, it's also good for yourselves because you can, you, you know, running your own business, you, you can, you can uh, assemble software together and uh, offer solutions and things. Um, and then it's good for uh, everyone uh, in compliance to legislation. So we see, uh, you know, ICT traditionally has not, well, the IT side of ICT, telecoms has been regulated for many years, but the sort of information technology side has not been regulated too much, um, but we are seeing obviously lots, uh, uh, this, this is increasing as, you know, the uh, information technology just takes over everything. Um, it's, now, it's now in your fridge, your dishwasher, um, obviously your, your mobile phone, and we see um, that, you know, uh, aspects like security and privacy are, are really important. So, uh, and complying with legislation, we, you know, with the, the regulations and directives that come out from uh, from the European Commission. Um, uh, standards are an integral, integral part of uh, presumption of conformity for, for products. Um, and you know, we are seeing that uh, being more of, uh, being applied uh, more and more to software and to services as well. So our principles um, really, so we are a hardware, software and cloud services company. Uh, we we offer uh, core technology. Uh, we are also in uh, various vertical segments: telecoms, retail, geospatial. The list is telecoms. Uh, the list is is very huge. Uh, uh, human capital resource management, uh, customer relationship management, and um, but we we believe you know standards provide interoperability, interoperability portability, and predictability. So the interoperability is I've, I've sort of mentioned the ability to you know, multiple uh, different vendors, different software solutions, uh, being able to talk to each other is very important. Portability uh, is actually multi-dimensional now. It you did used to mean you can, you can move your code from one machine to another or one operating system, but now it also means your data. You can move your data from one machine to another. Uh, it, it also talks about portability, it's also about skills portability that you can move between jobs and, and uh, not really have to retrain. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in, in this sort of the area that I work in, the, 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 the switching and cloud, cloud vendor switching and data portability is, is, is even more important. And then we have get to predictability, which is in those non, um, in, in areas where like market access, where you have to ship products, just uh, predictability of conforming to regulations is, is really important. And following the standards and implementing those standards is good from a sort of market access predictability perspective. Standards only succeed if they're widely adopted. And um, if you have multiple standards, then they do create uh, marketplace confusion. And then proprietary standards rarely provide a sustainable advantage. And I'm just gonna use one, one example to sort of cover those last three. Um, and I, I think some of us still have, have some uh, wounds over the wars, the OXML versus the ODF wars. So. Um, OOXML is, is, is the standard and, um, that, that Microsoft uh, um, fast-tracked through ISO, and it hasn't really been widely adopted, right? Uh, however, there is a, a, you know, a competing standard called ODF from OASIS, the Open Document Format, that also hasn't been widely adopted. Now, I'm not going to go, go into any sort of uh, economic models or, or market analysis here, but we have two standards, neither of which have been, I, I mean, they've been widely adopted by a single vendor. Um, uh, and but, you know, there's really still no choice in, in, in the market. I mean, yes, there, there is, I mean, they're good products, but there's the, the choice if you want to move from one to the other is, is very limited. Um, and I think this just, just does point to the, sort of the, 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 the end one there. Proprietary standards rarely provide a sustainable advantage and sustainable meaning over, over a long period of time. So our, our approach is that you know, the, the more the merrier, 
Um, we believe in you know multi you know heterogeneous um, environments. You know a single piece of software will not you know uh, running everywhere is either not not secure or not doesn't offer choice. So uh, a, a multi a, a multi uh, vendor uh, society is 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 where where, it, where it's at and where it should always be. Um, I'm just going to sort of finish now um, just by sort of saying that. Oracle, because I was asked to talk about sustainability, and here's a load of standards or a load of regulations that are not our normal, not my normal um, sort of, uh, you know, we, uh, bread and butter. Uh, but these are sort of some standards that because of the, um, you know, especially the push with the Commission and the, the Green Deal and the circular economy, um, this is a new area for me. I, delved in, I had to delve into, and there's suddenly like we are, have been following a whole range of um you know sustainability standards from you know how we build our data centers how we operate our cloud how we build our facilities how we make sure our facilities our offices um and everything are environmentally friendly um on our hardware we have to follow the hazardous substances ethical sourcing of chemicals uh, low voltage directories recycling <laughs> there's if you've never been in this world before, there's a lot there, and it's all designed to, to, to uh, you know, to help um, help our, our environment and and help uh, sustainability. And I think just quite recently, as of you know, we've made a commitment by 2025 that all of our data centres, all of our facilities, will be based on 100% renewability. But this is all this is all standards uh, standards driven, but it's all internal, right? The 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 customer does not, you know, the customer of our hardware products doesn't see it. You know, the, the, our employee, you know, effectively employees don't really sort of see this. It's all it's, it's all about, you know, our, our, you know, our commitment to the environment as a as a company, but being standards based and following all of these regulations. So that's that's what I really want to say. I mean, as of last night, so we have a database of our employees engaged. And I don't think this it certainly doesn't um, uh, account for most of the open source initiatives, but we are involved. I think Thomas mentioned there are 100, over 100 foreign consortia. We happen to be the 100, uh, last, last night was the 100 orgs. We are involved in 100 different standards organizations. We have over it's like 250 to 300 uh, you know, employees engaged in different standards. And that, that's actually quite low. Um, standards sort of eb ebbs and flows. So at the moment, it's sort of a, uh, eb ebbing away in, in favor of open source, but we know it will come back. Um, we're in like 300 technical working groups. We take five, you know, five, 54 type leadership roles um, or hundreds of leadership roles, which includes administration and boards and things like that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're um, pretty, we're very much committed to, to the standards arena. And um, I think the standards education is, is really important here. I just wanted to sort of ask anybody, who here ch chose a career in standards? Who, who said to, you know, when they were asked, like, as a teenager, what would you like to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a standard professional. I don't think anybody did, right? We all just drifted into standards, whether that's as a practitioner or as an educator or in government, um, you know, and I, I, it would be nice to change that somehow. That so, so it is a, a viable choice when people are looking at university careers and things like that. I mean, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting uh, um, uh, career. Um, it's uh, very, you get to meet some wonderful people and go to some nice places and it, it um, as, and, you know, we, we get these wonderful results. So I will, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Excellent, Martin. Uh, thanks very much for, for that uh, comprehensive uh, overview. Um, and I just, just one comment from our question for me. Um, that just sprung to mind there. I mean, when, when you started listing off the the um, number of organizations, et cetera, that um, Oracle is involved in, you know, HP wouldn't be quite as many, but, you know, re relatively similar, let's say. Um, but, but we both know that there are many organizations, reasonably large companies, who, who just don't um, engage. And if you tie that back to your comment previously in your presentation about, you know, um, competing standards and, um, overlap and, and that sort of thing. And I mean, obviously, if we could drive more people to take part in, 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 in the ecosystem, you know, we could probably minimize the um, divergence and, and, uh, and that. So getting to the question, like, and which is relevant to Yas is, 
you know, do you have any ideas for how you can better um, engage in, in, in talking about industry now, senior management on the value of standardization, how you can make that case internally in a company? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, again, it's unless so I you know, my, my two experiences in, in, in standards is, is obviously Oracle that started up as a standards based organization, you know, you know, the database, you know, and the SQL standard at the same time. And then the reason I moved to Ireland 25 years ago was a small Irish startup called Iona Technologies that was the first to implement the OMG Corpus standard, right? If, if the standard in your product is effectively the same thing, then you're a winner. If it's something that you're patching on at the, you know, at the end, right, then it, it's much harder. And even when regulations come in, I remember GDPR and then trying to uh, uh, convince people that they needed to implement one of the codes of conduct um, and standards aren't necessarily aren't necessarily the things you know in, in Oracle you know any, anything that gives us a technical requirement whether it's a code of conduct or a, a formal standard or a consortium standard we, we, we treat as a standards engagement um, and uh, you know we, we were developing you know involved in developing one of the codes of conduct for, data, for GDPR and the message we got <laughs> internally was don't bother us now. We're too busy doing GDPR compliance. I'm like, okay, but this helps you prove GDPR. So, so yes, it's, it's difficult. I think one of the, you know, as well as sort of education, I think some and and you know, the funding programs like Stand ICT, I think some sort of incentives for companies, tax incentives, or you know, it, it's sort of like the similar to the badge system. But if you if if, if you if you make some sort of you know, some incentives to organisations to to do this, you'll 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 join the two dots together. Um, even if it's taking on, uh, you know, X number of, you know, university trainees. So, you know, if you look at this, you, we can look at this holistically, but I think you do, would have to give incentives, right? It's not just about, you know, as we know, um, it's not just about funding people to go to meetings, right? Uh, it's the time and it's the, the, the ethos around that. And, you know, money talks, right? So actually a good point, because in, in, I know the US um, are looking at standard strategy as well. And that's one of the, the things that that's an element of it is tax credits for companies that uh, get involved. Yeah. OK, I don't have tax credit. I'm not I'm not an econo economic uh, mm. <laughs> expert here, but you know, any, any sort of incentive of, of that nature, you know, I think. Yeah, yeah. OK, I, I, I think in, in addition to that, Brian and Mark, like I me, mean, there has been in relation to the way the funding mechanisms are going like from a European Commission's perspective and Thomas might have a, have a comment on this as well is that uh, there's more and more references to standardization and how you align with standards technology development um, uh, uh, in the proposals now so uh, I think that if you're not cognizant of the standards landscape and you're putting in Horizon 22 Noel, Horizon Europe or DEP project now then I think it's less likely that you will get money so I think for large corporate partners uh, in large consortia bidding for European uh, funding uh, for RTDI projects, um, standards is becoming more important. Yeah. But that so so I just want to the, the other the other uh, thing as you know Brian and we've all witnessed that in you know some of our colleagues in large companies they suddenly get axed because the standards are seen as a tax you know a tax within the company you know it's a, an expense that that you can't do and then, and we've seen that whole departments so like 20 30 people just suddenly be axed because of because they are standards people right so it, it's it's a at the moment it's a very you know tricky um you know it's a delicate uh, issue i think you know as I say, who chooses to be in this career? It's a fantastic career, but... <laughs> yeah, but standardization is also a whole ecosystem. And uh, here, education and training is only one portion of the ecosystems. Like Ivana uh, clearly said, the practical involvement in standardization is really important. And uh, people need to be acquainted uh, how to do standardizations and how to... Uh, uh, right contribution. And that's why also I, as a stand ICT project on one side provides uh, what, uh, what we call the, the landscape analysis where standards are taking place. But on the other side, they giving, for example, uh, to experts, uh, small funds between 1000 and 8000 euros to, that experts could pay, for example, the fees to go to standards organizations and could uh, pay their flight or their subsistence 
to participate in standardizations organizations. And I think this is a quite incentive to, to, to uh, jumpstart, I would say, standardizations or getting new experts in standardizations. And we have to think about, uh, I heard a figure from China that uh, from universities per year, more or less 10,000 engineers are coming into the standardization systems per year with extreme well prepared into the process. And in that sense, we need to get prepared here also from the European side and make a, 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 an adequate response to that part. Thanks for that, Thomas. Yeah, um, I'm just conscious of, of time. Uh, Francesco, are we, are we okay to keep going for a bit, yeah? <clears throat> yes, I think we can tackle the last question from Jean-Francois, that is uh, waiting since a uh, since few minutes. And then I, I like if you allow me to, to close with a couple of uh, announcements for the, for the audience. But, uh, Go, go for okay, so Jean-Francois has a question in the chat. How to avoid a proliferation of ICT standards, create a portability issue for the vertical, vertical domains? Um, I, I, well, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, but we, I mean, we see this, unfortunately. I mean, uh, you know, as I said, as ICT creeps into everything, you know, whether it's sort of construction, you know, manufacturing uh, everybody wants their own cybersecurity, or everybody thinks the cybersecurity is different right so uh, you know the current uh, topic du jour is iot and then we've got industrial iot and consumer iot and yes they at a certain level they do differ um but at a sort of baseline level there's a lot of commonality and it does look like you know well who, who knows where the red red delegated act on cybersecurity is so it, it, it is an issue and i think um, we have to, we do have to think more about the verticals and we do, uh, sorry, the horizontals and we do actually have to have, you know, rather, rather than just the IT professionals in, in the sort of cybersecurity, we, we need the vertical people with vert vertical expertise in those horizontal ones, right? So in other words, let's just develop common ones, but that, that's, that'll evolve over time as, as we get used to it. I mean, what you don't want is everybody, invo you know, inventing their different languages, their different techniques, uh, when there's perfectly good ones already exist. But we also know computer science isn't really a science in that respect because we seem to ignore our predecessors, right? But, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, okay. but that, that's just the nature of the industry. So it's, it's, it's about engagement and it's about, um, uh, you know, op opening up to anybody that wants to participate and making it easier to participate and, and not building these silos. Yeah, thanks Martin. Uh, Ray, I think you wanted to say something on that, did you? Um, well, I think there is, yeah, it's really, Martin has covered it, but it's the fact that uh, there, we're all, standards means interoperability. So it's about trying to bring all of these systems together. And there will be slight migration, I think, and divergence yeah, as, as different verticals um, evolve at different paces. Um, but, but our job is, it's as, as standards experts and standards professionals, I suppose, is to try and minimize that as best we can. And, and that's, that's what the whole standards ecosystem is about, to, to remove as much duplication as possible and uh, duplication of effort as well as duplication of standards. Um, and, and I think that's the way the, the industry is going. And it's, it's heading in, in, in more and more in that direction where I think uh, a lot more of the pre standardization work is, is, is gone to multiple organizations now rather than, uh, and, and the, the, the long-term solution is to do that, is to have multiple organizations coming together to talk about standardizations and roadmaps and, and, and landscapes uh, prior to starting a big huge program, which is which is uh, which is driven in one direction by one particular organization. Like, we do have our own separate expertises, and you can see where different SDOs have really strong strengths, and they should be the ones that drive certain areas. You know, and we support them and collaborate with them. Um, and other and other SDOs have their strengths as well. And it's about, I mean, working together. I think is in, in, in a collaborative envir environment and ethos that will that will um, that will bring that on. Yeah, thanks. I, I, thanks Ray. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you kind of said it there that um, one of the ways you tackle proliferation is by raising awareness of what actually is happening um, and our landscape um, analysis and, and, our, um, and gap analysis, we should do that. And also the, the rolling plan, uh, to give it a plug, is, is doing that too, because it's identifying what's actually happening on any vertical uh, area. Um, and, you know, the more that's proliferated and people can see what's happening, you might be encouraged to join something that's already happening rather than starting something new. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. 
uh, in the chat on that. So, uh, Francesco, I think you wanted to have some closing comments. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, just a very quick uh, wrap up with some information for uh, those who kindly joined us and stayed with us so far. Uh, so operationally, we will have uh, you will be able to find uh, both the slides and the recorded webinar on our web page in uh, the next 24 hours, more or less. So take a look at uh, the website. And I, I also wanted to announce that uh, for after a um, short break, we are uh, um, almost ready to roll out the fourth open call on the coming 15th of July. So get ready for that. Stay tuned with our channels. And, uh, but anyway, the 15th of July will be ready and it will stay open for uh, 60 days until the 15th of September. And um, probably Ray knows better about this, but uh, even another uh, uh, landscape report is about uh, to be expected in, in, in the coming weeks uh, as well. But uh, again, stay tuned to our channels and uh, you'll get to know more. And uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you, uh, the, the four of you that have been really, the five of you, sorry. <laughs> It's been fantastic today. And it's always a pleasure to run this event with you. And uh, so thank you very much. And of course, to all of our audience, a lot of uh, uh, old friends I, I saw and new ones. That's very, very nice. And um, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank Good you everybody. Nice day. Take care. Take care. Thank you, bye.